Yeah. Awesome. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, irrigating the river of content, making workflows that work. Uh, this is a talk about building uh, custom tools for making video games. So, um, there we go. Who am I? Uh, I'm Ryan Klein. Uh, I've done a lot of tools development and, and general game development as my career as a gameplay programmer. Uh, I did some visualization tools and AR and VR for the DoD. I've made games and tools for making those games for the Army. Uh, also make some pretty cool visual novels on the side as laser bread games and do a lot of tool development there. And uh, now I'm a gameplay programmer at Lost Boys Interactive. Um, so that's my Twitter handle if you want to look me up. So what is this talk? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how and why to improve your work with tools. Um, and this is going to focus on like custom tools. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, maybe going out and buying uh, or using tools that already exist. Um, but we're going to focus on tools for like smaller teams, maybe like indie teams or small feature teams like on a bigger game. Um, we're not going to talk so much about like DevOps, so kind of uh, meta tools. Like we're not going to talk about uh, you know project tracking or or that kind of thing. They're mostly talking about tools for building out the game's content, like level editors and data validators and those sorts of things. Um, and my goal with this whole talk is to uh, alleviate some of the fear I see in some indie devs and in, in, in building out custom tools and uh, kind of let you all establish a more rigid foundation, more solid foundation for your work going forward by building really cool tools for yourselves. Okay, so what are we talking about when we say tools? Um, well, as simple as terms, a tool is anything that makes someone's job easier, like a hammer or a nail gun or something. Um, and good tools, I think, kind of accomplish uh, three major things, which is they enable the user to do more with more time, uh, more autonomy and more possibilities. Um, I think the obvious one is time. You can obviously save time using using a hammer, but you don't think about as much is that there you get more autonomy and possibilities out of it. So when someone learns how to use a hammer, they're able to build more. They're able to build more complex things. They're able to do things uh, in more complex ways, uh, especially as they learn better and better tools um, and as they get better at them. So um, with that being the case, and those three things being the case, uh, it kind of goes to, it kind of uh, follows suit that good tools will increase your team's overall enjoyment and fulfillment in the project because they can get to more of the things that they want to try out. They can try out more things. They can be more confident that they have the time and resources to build the thing that they wanted to build. So um, kind of a, a hidden metric that I think makes good tools really good. Um, now, there's kind of an infinite possibility space for tools. You can really build literally anything and, and, and use it, um, and you could spend your entire time building a tool. Like for a nail gun, for example, if you wanted to build like a raised garden bed, and first you set out to develop your own nail gun, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to spend most of your time making the nail gun, and you're never going to get your garden bed done. So, uh, you know, we're confined by, uh, you know, our time, our budget, and our skill sets. Another good example is, you know, if you're setting out to do a solo indie thing and you'd never really done 3D art, you really don't need to purchase a Maya subscription unless you really want to dig in and learn that. Um, you just need to be cognizant that this is going to take you a long time. You've got to be kind of self-aware in, in that aspect. So in that way, tools can drastically swing your scope in, in either direction. You can massively overscope yourself by building a bunch of tools, but you can also save yourself from a lot of scope problems by um, building better tools or using better tools. So don't be scared. Um, you know, scope is a scary thing sometimes, but I think that we have some pretty good ways to know when we're overscoping, and we'll talk about that as we go forward. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about that. When do we identify uh, that we need a tool, and what key things should we look for in identifying that we maybe we need a custom tool or we need to find a tool? Okay, so this is kind of a rough block out of like the typical development cycle for a video game, um, and a lot of these things are really a lot more nebulous than these like blocked out chunks and you kind of flow through them as you as you go along but um this is kind of useful for when we might want to start looking at 
tools development. So usually in concept, uh, you're, it's a little too early. You don't know the problem space. You don't know the things you're trying to solve. And you can't be sure that um, you have the right problem. And so you're going to build tools that aren't useful. You're going to build tools that don't solve the problem correctly. So not a good, good time to start imagining tools, but not a good time to start developing the tools and really going, going along with it. Um, once you hit prototype phase and you, you've concepted the game and you have a good idea of what you're doing and now you're building your first pass at something that's going to be put in front of players, um, that's when you start to really start to, the gears start to turn as far as you thinking about how this is going to interact with like how we're going to build 10 more of these levels, how are we going to build 100 more puzzles. Um, and you start to consider that. And then once you've solidified that with your player base and you kind of know where you're going and you're building a vertical slice, that's when you really start to get into, we need to prove that our pipeline works, that we can build a level and we can do it in a way that's quick and we can do it in a way that we'll use for the rest of production. So that's when you really start to develop tools and then into production, you're going to keep developing those and iterating on them and developing better tools. So this is where you start looking for sure. Um, at building tools. So what kind of uh, key things might you notice that would be very useful for you to build um, a tool for? Um, these are some that I've noticed, but there's definitely many others. Um, so modification, creation, and validation of content. So we're talking like level editors, puzzle building tools, things that validate your, your data. Um, if you have a game that has, you know, uh, 100 levels in it, uh, and you set out to build one level and it takes you days, um, there's probably a good chance that there's something you can do to streamline the workflow. Maybe build like a, a palette for level designers or you can build uh, things that help you path AI better. So there's all kinds of possibility space in there to build tools to speed up the process and also make the process easier and have people make less mistakes because less mistakes equates to speed it equates to possibilities and autonomy um, so that's important too it's not always just speeding it up um, a good example of this uh, when i was working at army game studio we built a surgery game that had like you know 10 to 15 different like surgical procedures and each one of these was on a touch screen and you had like all these multiple steps with like these hit boxes where you register doing different actions um and so we built one of those and it took us days and it was really tedious with all the kind of pixel pushing to fit the hit boxes where we wanted them to be so we decided to set out and spent about two weeks building a, like a level editor where we can edit all the hit boxes in camera space basically zoom in to where this frame is going to look and then edit the uh the hit boxes in 2d space there even though they're like 3d boxes um and that saved us so much time um and also added a lot to the abilities for our designers to iterate on the the um procedure so you know it might not be we could have probably finished you know 15 is not a huge number we had a lot of time we could have probably finished it without doing that but we would have not gotten as many iterations in um so that's a good example of uh, creation and modification of content um tool um also tools that automate steps in workflows or make them easier so maybe developer hot bars or menu items that might build and compile or do some sort of uh, tedious repetitive task for you are always good. Um, you save people time, you save people uh, cognitive load of trying to remember, oh, well, I have to hit the thing and do the thing and go here and click the button. Maybe they don't need to do any of that. Maybe they can just hit the hit the button and go. Um, one example of this, too, is, you know, to that same tool, it became very important that we needed to find a way to, like, have people test the procedures because it's hard to work on it and then try to like stuff it somewhere in the game and then go test it. So we added a play button right to the, it was a scriptable object in Unity. So now you hit play and the game loads and it has that procedure and you play it. Let's save people so much time and cognitive load to get there. Um, it's a good example. And one that uh, I don't think a lot of people realize is useful is, is tools that distribute work away from your bottlenecks. I've seen a lot of situations where maybe the gameplay programmers import everything art audio uh, everything goes through one or two people that 
control the Unity project and everybody else just makes stuff and hands it to them. And that's not super ideal, and we'll get into that more a little bit later, but uh, maybe you can split the work up so that when someone finishes an art asset, there's not this back and forth, and they can just put it in the game. And if you have a good tool that they can use to just stick it in there, and it validates, like, yes, this is the right pixel dimensions, and everything's good, uh, maybe that would be a way to save you a lot of time. Um, yeah, but should you build this tool? So you maybe you've identified some of these places where you think that a tool would be helpful, but there's still an argument to be had that maybe you shouldn't build it, right? So cost benefit analysis of tools. Uh, you know, teams can be scared of making, especially like big tools that really affect the workflow of their whole game. Um, but because timelines are often tight, you know, if you're an indie, you might only have a couple of months before your runway is out and you really need to get something out. If you're working for a customer, maybe they need, maybe they have a really tight schedule. Um, so sometimes you just really can't afford to build anything or you need to build something very rudimentary, um, for example. Um, but sometimes you're forced to build the tools. Like if you're making a game with like 3D levels and you don't have a 3D level editor, it's just you're not going to get very far. If you need to build something at a certain scale, you might be essentially required to build something. Um, so sometimes you don't have a choice, but sometimes you do. Um, so I want to kind of convince you that you should go more into the tools than you, you would think. Um, and there's two big, there's a few big reasons in the next couple slides, but here's two big ones uh, to start with. I think tools present a really decent business case for you, uh, no matter if you're doing like customer contract work or you're doing your own stuff, uh, because you want to build your team and your business around uh, improving as you go, right? And if you can build a tool uh, like a level editor or something that's robust enough to be used again, or maybe parts of it can be scrapped out and used again um, in the next game, you're going to speed up your process every game. And that's not to say you're going to make games necessarily faster, but it's going to give you way more time to iterate on everything. And the more iterations you get on anything in your game, just the better it's going to be. Um, you can you can really look at it over and over again. You could be done with the vertical slice way earlier and then be like, ah, well, we needed to do it this way. And then you could fix it. You have time. So I think that it's a really good idea to build tools because those are often the most reusable things that come out of a game. A lot of game code doesn't end up being very reusable because it's, unless you're making a second one or something, but the tools code, oftentimes you can find areas that you can extrapolate on. Um, and, and that's to say, too, that I think tools value, I've been talking about this a little bit already, but I think it scales almost exponentially to its input. So, you know, you probably might not need a tool for something that affects, you know, five files in your game. Like, let's say you have, like, a mini game in your game. Maybe you don't need a really complicated mini game level editor because you're only going to have like five levels of that. You just say, forget it. We're just going to slap it together with what we have in Unity or something. That's cool. But you're talking about like hundreds of levels or something. Um, there's a lot of value that goes even unseen in having a valuable level editor or tool to, to manipulate stuff in that way um, that you know, I've talked about a little bit, but I'll get into that more now. So some of these unforeseen benefits, um, better understanding amongst the whole team. So uh, tools are often a great language between designers and artists and the engineers who built them. Um, you know, instead of having to communicate things like, oh, if you put zero in this field, it will crash the game, yada, 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 those kind of I'm sure everybody who's worked on a game has had those kind of things where it's like, oh, I can't make this this or else it'll break. What if your tool just didn't let them do that? You know, it validated their input and said, no, that doesn't work. Um, now they have a deep intrinsic understanding when they're working every day on, the, on their part of the game. They're gaining that understanding. They're saying, oh, well, you know, obviously we can't do this and we can't do that. And now you don't really have to spend that time communicating um, and you can communicate about more important things. So uh, I think that's really good. Um, so creative roles get a better sense of what needs to be happening on the back end, but also the engineers get a better sense of what 
the designers want because you're having to communicate all the time as an engineer with designers and artists to figure out what they're doing and what they need to do and what their ideas are. And so you, this really helps keep people on the same page. Um, and I think it's really important to get as many people, um, artists, designers, audio engineers, everybody in the engine of the game as possible because I've had a lot of experience seeing people like, here's an art asset, and then two weeks later it's in the build, and they're like, well, that's not right. That didn't look right. Uh, that's not what I envisioned. And how do they know? If, if everything goes through a single point, through an engineer to go into the game, how do they really know that their stuff is working correctly? And so oftentimes to accommodate people coming into the engine that they don't have like a whole lot of experience in that engine or aren't programmers, you know, you might need to build a custom tool for them to use. And I think that that can really help everybody stay on the same page. Um, also, emergent design is a thing. So if you have uh, areas of your aim that are way easier to build, and really flexible and robust and kind of Lego block modular, uh, then, you know, you give people lots of ideas. So maybe, you know, you're making an RPG and you have this dialogue uh, system and then you're like, huh, you know, the dialogue system and the combat encounters both are just this event thing. Can I just stick a combat encounter in this dialogue? And it's like, oh, well, there's this one bug and we clean it up and yeah, it works. You know, so that kind of stuff emerges out of uh, having powerful tools to use. Um, and I have, an, I have an example of this, uh, something I've done. So we were working on another touchscreen table game that was like a shuffleboard uh, card game where you flick cards into uh, these little mission nodes and you use like solve missions together. It's like a four player co-op thing. Uh, we had, mostly for visual effects, we put in this, well, we had this timeline editor that lets you just kind of like a rail shooter, just put these events on a timeline so every, you know, X seconds a mission spawns. So mostly for visual effects, we added that you could fire an event when a mission completed or failed. Uh, and that was just going to be like, yeah, turn on the fire particles or whatever we needed to do. But when I was playing with it, I was like, hey, you know, an event is the same thing as what a mission uses. Can I make a mission come after another mission in this like weird chain thing and i had to like kind of hack it together uh and it didn't quite really want to do that but uh, you know just with a little bit of prodding i could get it to like when this mission's completed the next mission spawned right on top of it and we could chain them like this uh and it was a really cool moment in this like last sequence this kind of boss fight of this level we were able to do this like neat thing that we wouldn't have been able to do if we didn't think about okay well we need a robust enough tools to to get there um, so yeah, what kind of possibilities can your team see in those little spaces? So uh, how do we approach building these things? We talked a little bit about why to build them and, and when to identify that you might need them, but what do we do to build them? Um, a key point is to focus on leverage, right? Um, just like Gordon Freeman's crowbar, you want a little bit of input for maximum output. You don't really want to spend your whole time building a, a nail gun like the earlier example. You want to get to the garden bed thing. You want to plant your, you know, vegetables this year. So uh, keep it simple. You know, can you use what's already out there? You know, is there a um, prime example? We used Odin Inspector and Unity a lot to build our tools because it just made it a little bit easier to get there. We didn't have to worry about building complicated editor scripts. We could just kind of use what was there. Um, can, and uh, can you build the highest leverage parts first? Can you can you focus on like we just need a thing that puts missions in the level? Let's let's focus on that. Um, you might need to do it like a technical design on more details there. But if when you get to the building stage, if you could just focus on the primary problem and get that in front of your designers or artists to use it and start using it and and get a feel for it and give you feedback, that's really important. Um, and oftentimes, you know, if you went down the road of just building out the whole thing without really consulting anybody, the things you thought they needed are not going to be the things they needed. Uh, I notice this a lot. Like, I'll, I'll build a tool and I'll put it in front of somebody like, yeah, it's great. And they're just like, what is this? And they'll point to something I wasn't even paying attention to and be like, I can't, I can't use that. And then you understand, oh, there's something going on here where I didn't have the full context and they had more context. And if I had just shown them earlier... 
it would have been better. So uh, this is often called user-centered design, where you build something small and you get feedback, and you take the feedback and you implement it, and then you give it more feedback, and then you just keep going in a circle until you're you're confident in the tool. Um, and again, there's a cost benefit to this. You don't have an infinite time, so you want to try to hit it on the on the on the head early. So you don't want to iterate all day, but you know you want to keep you want to start simple and move on from there. Um, so I'm not going to get too much into like UI UX design because I'm not a UI UX designer. Um, there is a good talk by someone who's better at that um, that I'll have a, a link to later in the slides. But um, one thing I did want to hit on are affordances and constraints. So if you've read uh, Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman, uh, it's a really good book that talks about this kind of um, a lot. And I think if you haven't read it, you should you should give it a try if you like building tools or anything for people to use, including like game UI. But um, yeah, so affordances are kind of how an object begs to be used. So a light switch affords that I flick it up and down. It makes me want to flick it up and down because it looks like something that should go up and down. And it also affords that it stays in either on or off because it's difficult to get it to stick in the middle. So you don't think that you're supposed to leave it in the middle. You don't think to yourself, this is a slider. You understand it's like toggleable because it, it snaps to on and off. So that's kind of an affordance that it has. Um, and constraints are how an object can't be used. So if I was to take that, that radial dial in this example, and I was to try to move it up and down like the light switch it, it just wouldn't do that at all it just i could tell that if i tried to do it i was going to break it and it would feel like it wasn't supposed to do that um so that's a constraint um that is how an object says uh, you can't use me like this um and that's a good way to reduce error cases right so if you if you want to build in constraints to where uh a user can't do something like let's say for example you use an enumerated value instead of like a string type so you don't let them enter anything into this except for the you know list of values that that you know are good to go um, because otherwise it'll break that's like the first ticket to like validating data right um so it's important to consider these um and how they affect your tools uh, this also could affect the emergent design stuff you don't want to go too hard on the constraints because maybe there's some places where you're like, well, why, who am I to dictate that you can't do that? Let's let them see what they do with it, right? So there, there's kind of a give and take there, but those are important things to think about. Um, and communication. So some key questions to ask yourself in your team um, are, you know, what problems does our user, does this tool actually want to solve? So, you know, do they, do they really need what they're asking for? Or can I dig a little deeper and figure out why they feel like they need that thing? Um, so, you know, for example, we built like this finite state machine code uh, at AGS that was uh, really robust and cool. But we kept talking about doing like a visual editor and stuff. But we realized that the only reason we kept asking about a visual editor is because it was difficult to track visually what was going on or mentally it's hard to like keep that in your brain so uh, even just adjusting our like interface a little bit to look a little cleaner and, and write a little cleaner kind of helped us realize that maybe we didn't need that to that extent we just needed to be able to map these things in our mind easier um, one small example um, another question is how do people use your tools and how do they fit in with their other tools so when they're when they're using your tool, is it like a super pain in the butt to like do they have to close everything that they have open right now and then go open your thing and then they have to like open this file that they made in the other tool? You know, is there import and export processes happening? Are those complicated? Are those difficult? Uh, does does the tool um, you know work in totally different ways or like they have to go on some other computer somewhere? Like you know, are those problems that you need to think about? You need to solve. Uh, and how can you make that the easiest for people to transition into using your tool for their entire workflow? And then um, in that same vein, like what tools are these users used to and what tools exist that solve similar problems? So 
when you meet someone's expectations on how something should work, that's kind of a shortcut to them understanding it. And this happens in, in games, too. We talk about games literacy, and we talk about, uh, you know, if you're making a first-person shooter, they've all kind of s centered on a certain control scheme for, like, Xbox controllers and for mouse and keyboard because people come to expect it. And it doesn't really gain them anything to deviate from the norm, and people who are literate in first-person shooter games will understand it immediately, and then you can focus on teaching them more interesting things about your game. Uh, the same is true with tools. Uh, if, if someone's a 3D artist, and you have a 3D level editor thing, and that artist uses Maya exclusively, think about building in navigation in a way that makes sense for Maya, or maybe you just even using Maya. It's like you use it writing your own plugin, that kind of thing. Um, make it to where they already get most of it, and now you're teaching them what they need to know, not going back to square one and teaching them everything. Um, and these are kind of coming from a really good talk by David Lightbound. Uh, he's got a GDC talk. Uh, I got a link to it later. That was the one I was talking about earlier. Um, so check that one out, because uh, it's really good. Uh, he basically interviewed a bunch of different tools developers in the industry and pulled some takeaways from it. It was really, really influential on, on this talk. But yeah, and then another thing to do um, when you're approaching tools is to start early and really understand the problem. So, you know, we talked about tools coming in kind of during and after the prototype because you can't solve problems you don't have. If you don't know how the levels are going to look or how the levels are going to work, you can't build a level editor. Don't try. You will build all the stuff you don't need. You'll throw half of it away. The other half will be repurposed to like and it'll become a monster. It'll just be this nasty conglomeration of code that you never needed and that you stapled stuff onto. So give yourself a break, focus on other stuff, and then come back to the tool when you know what the designer wants to do with it. And like we said earlier about leverage, build the simplest part of it first so you're not extrapolating out into like this infinite universe of possibilities and you start developing a nail gun when you need a garden bed making tool, right? Uh, so... On that same page, you know, get everybody on the same page about design. Uh, what's going to happen in this game? What do we know? What What is unknown? Um, and that kind of thing. I've seen this done in two different ways now. Uh, at bigger AAA games, I think a lot of the times there's kind of key vision holders and people like us lowly engineers are kind of told <laughs> what the vision is going to be and we have to execute on it. Um, I've also seen in more like small indie conglomerates where you just have a bunch of meetings and you keep track of what the vision is and everybody has a stake in the design and you're all communicating a lot. I like, I like the second way a little bit better, but I understand that it's definitely not feasible when you have hundreds of people working on a game because uh, it, it would dissolve into chaos. So, um, both ways work, so whatever suits your team style, I think, is, is, is worth approaching, but you need something there. Um, and also, map out the whole flow for content. And once you understand what the problem is, you need to understand all the problems. So think about, you know, how do they create these things? How do they modify these things? How do they put the things in the level? How do they test the things? Uh, that was something that I experienced a lot on that surgery game because I built this whole editor that was really good at modifying the, the procedures. But when you wanted to make a new one, it was like 15 steps of making files in Unity in different places and then dragging them over here and then hitting this button and then doing this thing. And uh, I, didn't, I just kind of glanced over that. And then someone, when they set out to make a new one, was like, hey, man, I can't figure this out at all. This is really complicated to make a new procedure. So then I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, okay. So I didn't map the whole workflow beforehand, and so I needed to go back in and think, okay, how do I do this? And it ended up just being like a Confluence page where he talks about, hey, it's easier just to copy one and delete the stuff, and et cetera. But that's something. That's kind of a tool in and of itself, right? Documentation. Um, but yeah, so, you know, you're your own first tester. You're your own first user. Um, you get really good at the practice of just taking off your engineer hat for a minute pretending that you have no idea how any of this works and you're just some random level designer coming into it for the first time, and then just start start trying, see what happens. Um, that will help you map that process out. That will help you gain a better understanding. Um, that will help you look for inconsistencies of what tooling you built versus what the design is. And so that's super valuable. Alrighty, so that was kind of a, a high-level how-to. 
but when we set out to architect our game such that we can use tools or we get the most out of tools, uh, what are some, some key things we can do there? Um, keep it data driven. This is super important. Uh, keep your data out of your systems. You know, you want you want code that, that takes input and executes on it and then spits out output. You don't want big, complicated, monolithic classes uh, because your tools can't operate on them. Your tools can operate on a JSON file, on XML, on a scriptable object. Your tools, your tools can change those, and it's really easy. And then if your game is just some kind of system that takes that scriptable object and spits out game, now you can do that. And it's very simple. So if you start with that concept early, even before you're thinking about, like, you know, even in the prototype, before you're even knowing what kind of tools you need, but you're just keeping it, okay, these are, this is data classes that have data in them, and this is the system that's going to use them, uh, you're going to be able to make tools a lot better uh, instead of having to refactor these monoliths and to break them down into stuff that you can actually write tools for. Um, and you should keep those systems robust enough to kind of open up the space for all kinds of input. I know that's kind of counterintuitive to what I said about constraints, but this is where that emergent design stuff comes in. Um, you know, think about the difference between an error and a possibility space, right? Uh, if you have, again, I, I harp on string lookup. Uh, my friend Clark, who's given a talk later, has, has got me off the bandwagon of, of like string-based APIs. So you should check out his talk later too. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if you have an error space where a, a person can put in literally any word and only like maybe 200 words do anything, that's kind of not great, right? Because if they mistype it, if they put in the wrong thing, if they have a misunderstanding, it'll just completely break. So you want them to pick like maybe an enum of like the different types you have available. But that isn't to say that if they want to try to stick a mission at the end of a mission instead of a visual effect, that you shouldn't be like open to it. So this is a good place where like in C Sharp, uh, using interfaces helps a lot, and C++ uh, using inheritance to like kind of develop a, a, a polymorphic way in which your systems can take data that's like, I know this is the kind of thing that has, that is an event. I don't know what the event does, but I can call start and I can call end, and that's all I need to know as the system that runs the thing. You start to develop... Um, that possibility space, but you limit the errors at the same time because you can't put in any old thing. It has to it has to implement these things. Uh, so that's a good idea. Um, yeah, and then more about modularity. Uh, it, you know, think about your game like a Lego set, right? You're you're making a Lego set to build a, a Star Wars uh, Death Star, but it's a Lego set. I could take this Lego, and I could put it somewhere else. I could take this character, and I can use it in my other Lego set. You know, you, that's what you want. You know, because you might start out trying to build a Death Star, but really, they were like, oh, you know, we can make a really sick Tide Fighter here. Like, let's forget the Death Star. These tools work for this, too. You know, we made Death Star, too. Oh, all right, cool. <laughs> so, uh, if you avoid the monolithic classes, and you let, like, your game be composed of like multiple components and they're small and they do one thing and they do it well, um, then you kind of end up having this robust set of game code and this robust set of tools and then you can mix and match how they work together and they all come out for the next game and you're a happy camper. So keep it modular, super important. So to wrap it up, I'm just going to go over some best practices from my experience kind of making some tools. Uh, that hopefully uh, help you. So, uh, like I said, build high leverage tools. Um, you know, don't build tools that don't give you a lot back because you only have so much time. So, you know, can you use something that's already out there? Can this just be a spreadsheet that I import for into a CSV file and I just do that? Is that fine? That might be fine. Um, only make tools for the major bottlenecks or content areas. You know, it's like optimization. Um, when you're optimizing code, you don't you don't sit there and optimize this this tiny part that that saves you a, a nanosecond when you know your update loop over here is taking up 
you know, five milliseconds. You don't you don't want to you don't want to waste your time optimizing every small thing away when you have bigger fish to fry. So build the high leverage stuff, um, and then get the eighty percent solution out, and then work with your team on what the twenty percent should look like. Just here's the thing. Now what do we do? Constant communication. Uh, good tools are really good at doing one thing. Uh, you don't need to uh, make like this magic wand that solves every problem. You want a tool belt with multiple tools in it. You know, we don't need the the buzzing whirligig. We want a hammer to solve one problem, and then next time we need nails in the wood, we'll go get our hammer. Uh, that's what you should be thinking about. Uh, and then you know, y you might build the tools, all the tools, and actually a tool belt, and that just slots tools in. That's a lot better than the, the magic wand solve every problem approach, right? So keep it keeping it modular again. Um, and keep it practical too. Like a lot of people I see, they take tools and they make them and they say, I'm going to put this on the asset store because it's useful, which means that someone else will find it useful. There is a large gulf of execution between you making that tool for you to use and you putting that tool on the asset store, not to mention the amount of work it takes to get the tool on the asset store. So, uh, I'm not saying um, that you shouldn't put tools on the asset store, but you should think about it harder than just saying, well, I have it, and so it, someone will use it. Um, consider if you want to be in the tools business or the games business, and maybe you just want to keep it to yourself. It could be nasty around the edges. It could look like crap, but if it works for you and you can make games with it fast, that's way less to worry about. So... Uh, I'm kind of an advocate of that. Um, and to that same end, you want to solve the real problem. Is the real problem that you want to pull a tool on the asset store, or is the real problem that you need to make a hole and you have three months? You know, solve the real problem. Uh, and and take the free wins. Uh, tools can enable your team to discover new paths. So put them in. Like if you if you see some emergent design. Uh, you know, kind of improv style, say yes and, and then add some more, add some more code to let that happen. Um, that is scope creepy, so manage that as you will, but uh, I think that I would rather have a wealth of ideas and manage it down than be limited by my tools to only work in some small domain and then be like, well, this is what we got, you know. Uh, so take those free wins. Um, Build tools and use them to their full extent and push it. Push it as hard as you can from the get-go. How can I break this thing and get something cool out of it? Um, and, you know, if you architect your game around the idea that you're going to build tools, that also kind of helps you architect your game around that you're going to build tests. You can start building tests. Uh, you can start uh, having cleaner code in general. This is going to help you understand stuff. So that's another free win for you is just... Pretend you're going to have tools even if you're not because there's just a lot of benefit to writing your code that way. Um, and understand the job. So, you know, you can't make good tools without understanding how they're used. Um, pretend you're the first-time user. Get in there. Talk to your team a lot. You know, I'm play, play designer for a day. Uh, try it out. Play artist for a day. Try it out. See what happens. Um, if you understand deeply the problems that these people have, then you're going to be able to write better tools for them. And then finally, like, document everything. Uh, a good tool is good, but if they don't know how to use it because they can't find a way to, like, do the thing, you know, then they're, they're going to have to contact you. And it, sometimes it's helpful to have, like, a, pers a, a um, self-actualizing lookup so they can just say, like, well, I don't know how to do this. Oh, well, he wrote this page that has all this data on it that I can go look and see how to do that. Um, so keep the knowledge at arm's reach. Uh, you don't want to always be called upon. And you want, like, when you, when you eventually pass on from uh, that studio or whatever, you want them to still be able to do that because you want everywhere you go in the games industry to be a little bit better because you were there, right? So document everything. Um, yeah, and so here are a lot of really cool resources that I uh, used to uh, write this and that are useful. Um, I can post them in the general chat here in a minute. And uh, thanks. That was that was my talk. So you can look me up on uh, Twitter, and I would love to see if you're building tools or you're using tools, and you and you have some cool ones. Share them with me, and I'd love to see them. Great presentation, Ryan. Thank you very much. A lot of good feedback in the uh, chat already. Blanton Whitworth uh, 
says, uh, this has been a good talk. I'll have to use these points more at my work. Puzzles by Joe says, tools have to be truly seamless to be really useful. If you have to think about what to use the tool and or where you can and not apply it, then it won't be useful. The more seamless your tools are, the better off you are. And good talk. Bruce Wilson had a specific question on how hard do you find it to transition from full working game in C-sharp with GDI Plus to Unity? And any recommendations on making that process less painful? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, this I can kind of answer this generally. I haven't used GDI, but um, to kind of answer it generally, like, the idea of, of, of working with a new tool, especially one as big as Unity, because uh, I've had to do that recently. I just switched from using Unity to using a fully custom engine. Um, it, it just, you just have to spend time and play with it. You really just have to get in there and try stuff. And you're, you, you, it's, like, it's like eating an elephant or whatever. It's kind of grotesque, but it's like you, you, you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? You can't go in there and learn all of Unity in one day. You just try to solve problems with it, and after a few months, uh, you'll start to say, "Hey, I have a pretty big wealth of knowledge in this in this engine now." And it's it's anxiety inducing. It's scary. Um, I had that same experience of like, "Man, I don't know anything outside of Unity because I can't do any of this." But after it's been three or four months now, and I'm like pretty confident in this like custom engine I'm working on. So I think it's true for anything. You just you just have to get in there and 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 play and see what they did. And a lot of concepts translate, so you'll be quicker than you were if you started fresh. So, give it a go. All right, excellent. Simon Havis recommends Don Norman's Emotional Design as another resource for folks in chat. Um, one area you touched on, which I think is important, uh, especially for smaller indie devs, is the asset store and adding that into your workflow. So I think for a lot of smaller devs, their tools process begins with an analysis, if, if they're working in Unity, on the asset store. Are there tools that suit my needs? They download them. They put a day or whatever into it to start hashing it out. And what those tools don't provide, they know they then have to build or bug the, the, the tool creator to maybe implement these in the near future. Do you have any recommendations both on incorporating that tool analysis into your workflow and what sort of things you should be looking for. Yeah, so that's something I think that can can really happen um, in that prototype phase, in that vertical slice phase. There is a whole wealth of work that kind of starts before you develop you're developing tools that is just analyzing the market space for all these different tools that exist. Um, I find often that, uh, unless it's a really simple problem, that other people's tools on the asset store are problematic in the way that they don't usually solve the exact problem you have. And so sometimes you don't want to try to adapt something not meant to do what you're trying to do into what you're trying to do. And it's easier to start fresh. Uh, but sometimes you get lucky and someone has done this perfectly. Like Odin Inspector, I used uh, Ink for my for my visual novel and that was just exactly what I needed. And it was awesome. So uh, I think that you should be spending a whole lot of time up front before you write the tools, taking the design you and your team have decided on and then just like trying to figure out if there are tools that exist that do that. Um, and it's not limited to the asset store. I think uh, also just hunting and pecking through Unity's docs, if you're using Unity or Unreal or whatever, looking through their documentation to see like, oh, they have like speed tree. Maybe that's all I need for my trees. Maybe I don't need to do all this like crazy tree development stuff for example so maybe there's stuff that's already in the engine too that that could solve your problem um so yeah so spend more time on the asset store up front and then less on worrying about cleaning up your custom tools for later because i mean as much as you want to give back to the asset store uh if it if it helped you i think that it's valuable to do that but just know what you're getting into i guess is the main thing all right, I want to get back to the idea of selling the asset store, but let's address something else you brought up, which I think is a often critical bottleneck in smaller studios. And that is after you've analyzed a tool, you figured out what it needs, you put it into, you've developed it, you put it in people's hands, then prioritizing the tools fixes along the way. So you think you've come up with the perfect design for your tools, you've handed off the nail gun 
to the devs and they're either shooting themselves in the foot or they don't know how to set hook it up to the pneumatic uh, canister or whatever. How do you implement that sort of back and forth into a small studio workflow, especially when the person who's getting the tools handed them is generally junior to the person making the tools? Yeah, I think um, it's kind of... The first step is always like an open door policy. Like, hey, if you have any trouble at all, um, I want you to reach out in whatever chat that you guys have. It might be just come over to my office or whatever. But uh, as someone working on tools, you have to be open. You can't shut yourself off people asking you questions. Um, but sometimes people are more pull people and not so much push people. They might not come to you with questions or they might not realize that this is a thing they could even question, right? So it's important to watch them use it um, at some point. Maybe go over there or, or just be like, hey, I'm going to, um, let's, hop in a, let's hop in a video call and I'm going to walk you through the tool and show you everything um, now that it's in a workable state. And then you just stop me if you're confused and then uh, have them kind of reiterate back to you what they understand. Maybe, maybe see how the first couple of assets go and then check in on them and say, hey, did, how did that go? Was there, any, uh, was there any struggle points that you had you had issue getting through? Um, obviously, bugs and stuff come up. And sometimes people don't know their bugs. They, they hit some brick wall and they go, oh, I guess it doesn't do that. But you did, you wrote that code. It just, oops, it never came up, right? <laughs> so uh, you got to be able to watch and go back and forth, which is a lot easier on smaller teams. I think like if you're doing something like you you wrote this tool and then you're giving it to a contractor. I'm in kind of one of those scenarios right now. It's Sometimes it's very difficult to like have the contractor bubble up all the way through their management and talk to you and be like, hey, what's going on? But uh, the the biggest point is just being open and being available as someone who's writing tools to just have anybody and everybody who's using it come find you and ask you questions. And then if you can, reach out and poke them and say, how's it going? How's it going? Are you frustrated? Is something wrong? I think that's a good start. I think that's a great analysis because it is hard for someone who's new to often have that. It's not just a confidence to approach, but even the knowledge that they need to be doing that. They've been handed a tool set, and if it's not doing what they think it's supposed to do, they think it's their fault, and they're banging their heads against it. Another yeah, I don't want them wasting whole days, you know, just <laughs> trying to solve your problem. Yep, and something else I recommend, in the, in the old days, we used to have our company wikis with all these things described, and no one wanted to read through all that. <laughs> but I think that toolmakers now making those internal videos to explain the tools is invaluable. And folks, even if they've had the walkthrough, might forget that it was supposed to do this thing and go back and watch that video, or just have it on in the background while they're working and get uh, regular refreshers. Um, yeah, I've even had that, like... Uh on the opposite, in the opposite way, where like someone who has become well versed in using the tool that they didn't build made a video and put it on the wiki, and that was super helpful for everybody. So, uh, yeah, we we have like OBS and stuff now. Just slap slap some videos on your wiki. That'll help a lot. Oh, that's a great point, Camtasia. Just capture what you're doing. No, that's a great point to have the user make those videos too. Didn't think about that. Um, so let's talk about the asset store. So. Um, you have a, a natural reluctance for a game dev to be focusing on putting their tools up. It's distracting. It takes away time. Yes, it could be a good revenue stream, but by the same token, it might just uh, lessen both the game dev and the tool dev to be messing with that. And of course, it's going to be harder for you to be responsive to people who get it and have needs who buy in the asset store and say, it doesn't do what I need. Do you have time to go back and address it? What do you think are the major um, considerations a tool developer should have before putting assets up in the asset store? All right. Um, I think it's similar to what I talked about in the talk as far as thinking about uh, what are my users going to want out of this, but now multiply your users by like a thousand more people that all want to use this tool to do various things. Um, a good example is like I was... I spent a lot of time trying to clean up uh, my visual novel builder layer on top of ink, uh, which I called spaghetti, and I was going to put on the asset store. Uh, but I, I started to see that gulf of execution of like, all right, I have to make every aspect of this 
not so crufty anymore. Um, when I'm using it, I know that I have to stick this string in this file over here. Whatever, it's fine. I have to slap this uh, stuff in the inspector to make it work. Uh, I did all those little bits and knobs that you, you don't really want to clean up because you don't have to because it's a one-time deal or whatever. But for someone who's never seen this before and is, doesn't have the context of your game or wants to build some slightly different game with the same tool, that's going to be a, a pain point for them. You've got to clean up every single one of those. Um, so not saying don't do it because when you add stuff to the asset store, you, you help everybody, um, especially if it's really good. Um, you make everybody have an easier time using Unity and it, or whatever it is. Unreal. Uh, I'm a little biased toward Unity right now. But, but uh, whatever uh, engine it is, you're helping everybody. Uh, so it's, it's worth doing it from like uh, that standpoint. And you, know, you could make some good money off of it too. Uh, but just consider that like, it's, not, it's not a small amount of cleanup. It's cleaning up every single dusty corner of that tool. Every little bit. So you know, buy, buying into it is a tough sell sometimes. And I personally recommend looking at selling tools on the asset store if you're looking for investors. A couple of things we've noticed is that investors want to see multiple revenue streams. They want to see revenue streams early before your game is launched. And um, they, uh, they want to see that there are other things that they could, that they're, they're investing in a studio, not just your game. And this helps show that you have that. So if you're looking for investors, that tool's, uh, revenue stream is well worth considering. Ron Jones, the artist, has a good question for you. Uh, for less experienced developers, would you recommend using multiple tools from multiple creators or learn building a game with one or none for your first game or games? Uh, I, think, I think I would lean toward more tools um, than, than less uh, for someone inexperienced because... Uh, not only is that going to make it easier for you to do things, um, I think you'll start to understand that um, you have games literacy. This is like game building literacy. What kind of stuff people use to make games. Uh, and, and a lot of it comes across and ends up being really common. Like if you use a bunch of like a lot of UIs use like a state machine to build the game and you know, you might run into that in one tool and then later another tool comes up uh, and you're like, oh, this is the same as that other thing. Or like, you know, you get used to image editing in GIMP and then you see Photoshop and you're like, oh, it's the same it's the same thing. So I think just from a purely gaining experience standpoint, use a bunch of tools. Uh, but, you know, don't let yourself be um, too distracted from your goal and end up like getting confused and have this huge cognitive load of using a bunch of tools. Think about the whole thing uh, and like, do I really need this big chunk for the tiny little part I'm using or can I make something that's a little bit better for that? Uh, so it's just a kind of a holistic like um, thinking big picture uh, about what tools you need. Uh, but le lean toward using more, I think. All right. Great stuff. Great presentation. Thank you for jumping on early. And uh, if you are n in our Discord, go ahead and jump in the voice chat because that's where Ryan's going next to answer any more comments, uh, answer more questions, share more comments, and for networking. So thank you again, Ryan. Great presentation. And everyone join us soon for designing non-toxic communities.